to the, um, the introduction in, in one minute from now. Okay, so hi everyone and welcome to our morning session about uh, approximation algorithms and lower bounds. Uh, so just a couple of uh, reminders for those of you who maybe haven't attended other sessions. So we have, what is the format? We have 10 minutes um, per presentation, including um, questions and answers. Those can be either, um, you can either write them in the Q&A. I won't stop the presentation in the, in the middle, but only after the end we'll answer them. And then I will read the questions um, or uh, the speaker can. We'll, but uh, let's go, the default will be that I, I do that. Um, and you can also ask, you can also raise your hand and then I will allow you, if you prefer to say it, to speak it, uh, then that's, that's, also, that's also good. Um, so I think we'll just go ahead and start with, um, with the first, uh, first talk. So uh, Cruz, maybe you can, you can share your screen. Uh, and so the first talk is Breaching the Tree Approximation Barrier for Connectivity Augmentation, Reduction to Steiner Tree. And Afruz uh, Balameli will give the talk. Thanks. Thank you, Dana. Hello, everyone. This is a joint work with Yaroslav Birka and Fabrizio Grandoni. In the connectivity augmentation problem, as an input, we are given a k-edge connected graph G and a set of additional edges, which we call them links. Uh, for example, in this figure, you can see that there, we have a one-edge connected graph drawn in black, which is the tree, and it's the graph G, and the links are drawn as the dash red edges. And the goal is to find the minimum collection of links such that if you add them to the original graph, the graph becomes k plus one is connected. An insightful theorem in this area to mention is one by Dennis et al. in 1987. It states that any instance of the connectivity augmentation problem can be reduced in polynomial time to k equal to one when k is odd and to k equal to two when k is even. So basically we have to narrow our attentions into two cases. The first case is the case that k equal to one, which can be further reduced to the case where the input is a tree and is known as the tree augmentation problem or TAP. And the second case is when k is equal to two. This case can be also reduced to the case where the input is a cactus and it's known as a cactus augmentation problem or CAP. Note that the cactus is a connected graph in which every, every edge belongs to exactly one cycle. The state of the art of these problems are as follows. So TAP is known to be a fixed art from 2004. There were a long sequence of improvements for TAP in terms of approximation factor. The first algorithm proposed was a two approximation by Fredrickson and Yaya. Then the barrier of two was broken by Nagamuchi and then later this was improved to 1.8 and then to 1.5. And the current best known is a 1.458 approximation algorithm by Grandoni et al in 2018. However, the situation for CAP is entirely different. To the best of our knowledge, the best approximation algorithm is a two approximation algorithm by Camel Jane for the connectivity augmentation problem. Specifically for this problem, in 2019, we presented a 1.5 plus epsilon approximation algorithm for the case where cactus is a cycle together with Calves, Grandoni, and Sornat. And now for the first time, we present, we, we break the barrier of two and we present a 1.91 approximation algorithm for the cactus augmentation problem which immediately implies that also the connectivity augmentation problem admits a 1.91 approximation. Our approach begins with the reduction to the signatory problem. Recall that in the signatory problem as an input, we are given a graph G and the vertices are partitioned into two sets named the terminals and signer nodes. And our goal is to find a subtree of the graph G with the minimum number of edges such that this tree contains all the terminals. 
we, we show that there exists a polynomial time reduction from any instance i of the factor segmentation problem to an instance j of the symmetry problem with set t of terminals such that the number of terminals is equal to the number of degree two nodes. And also from any feasible solution of size alpha for i, you can get in polynomial time a feasible solution of size alpha plus size of t minus one for j. And this can be also done in the other direction. Basically any feasible solution of size beta for j can be transformed in polynomial time to a feasible solution of size beta minus size of t plus one for i. And we have a lower bound. So if you add any feasible solution to the graph G, you should have a 3H connected graph. So basically this says that any feasible solution for the cartridge segmentation problem must be an edge cover for the set of degree two nodes. And this implies that the size of the optimal solution must be at least the size of T half. For example, in this figure, you can see that the blue links, they do not cover V6. So this is not a feasible solution. Consider V6 and now we have a cut of size two. Now we have all the ingredients to obtain an approximation algorithm for the cut segmentation problem. So let up to be the optimal solution for the cut segmentation problem instance using the reduction we can get a solution of size, size of opt plus size of t minus one for its corresponding assignatory instance. And then if you take any row approximation algorithm for the assignatory problem, using the other side of the reduction, one can obtain a solution of cost size of opt plus size of t minus one times row minus size of t plus one for the cut segmentation problem. So, Putting it together with the lower bound, this yields a three row minus two approximation. Remember that the lower, our lower bound relates the size of op to the size of t. And by studying uh, the previous works on the signature problem, one can realize that the current best known approximation ratio for this problem is an ln row plus epsilon by Birka et al in 2013. And unfortunately, this is not enough for us since three row minus two is greater than two still. So to break the barrier of two, what we did is that we basically opened the box. So we went through this paper of Birka et al. And we tried to modify their analysis in the favor of our instance. Consider that our instance was a reduction. So we had this special gadget and our gadget was more structured than an arbitrary instance of the assigned tree problem. But to see how this works properly, I invite you to watch the full video. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so thanks to Cruz. Uh, so the clapping, I will do that symbolically for, <laughs> for us all. Um, okay, so while we're waiting to see if there are any raised hands or questions, sometimes there's a bit of delay. Um, so maybe I will ask you though, maybe you won't have a lot of time. So, so if you can say just a couple of words, there, what do you use, what kind of properties of in your reduction on the Steiner tree do you, do you use to get the better Right, the better bound. That's like the, the main, right, the main issue that uh, allows you for this bound. Oh, okay, so basically if you consider any links, so uh, the reduction has this property that's uh, uh, any signer node is connected to at most two terminals and also the terminals they form an independent set. Yeah, and, and this is very useful for us, yeah. Okay, thanks. So I see now, um, I'm told that there are a couple of questions in the Slack channel. So, um, but I think, I don't know, I think this will be difficult. I'm not sure everybody can now switch to the Slack and I think this will cause some delay. So what I'll do is I'll ask if there are people who wrote at questions in the Slack channel, and I don't want to switch to that, then ask them to either raise their hand or write or copy their questions here. And if, if that doesn't, okay, so we have it, we have here. I don't know if it's from the Slack or not, but I'll go ahead and, and go with the quiz. So um, the question is, uh, uh, is Dinitz et al. reduction from connectivity augmentation to tap and cap approximation preserving? Yeah, well, a very nice question. Yeah, yes, indeed, indeed, it's uh, approximation preserving. Okay, so wait, is there any more, more questions? So maybe I'll ask also a kind of, kind of maybe an obvious question, but still, so you get this, sure. right? It's 1.91. So probably, right, it's not, it's 
not the constant it doesn't that, that you that exactly, you have, exactly right so i know it's kind of it's always a hard question do you what do you believe is the true but still i'll go ahead and ask it what do you believe is the true answer well the true answer you you mean like if we analyze all algorithm properly or the best for this problem because it's different right uh so would say the best for this yeah, so, so I guess like if we push it a little bit further, still we, we can like get H3 and by H3, I mean the harmonic number of three. So it's like 1.83, something like that. Okay. Yeah. So we have one more. Um, is there any lower bound for tap and cap? Uh, well, they, they are known to be APX hard, but like it's close to one plus epsilon, right? Mm. It's very, it's very small. Yeah. So if there are no uh, further questions, then we'll uh, I'll thank the foods uh, again, and we'll continue to to the next step, uh, the next talk. So we'll switch the screen sharing. Okay. So um, our next talk is uh, a spectral approach to network design, uh, and Hong Zhu will give the talk. So we'll just do okay. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. And so today I'm going to talk about a spectral approach to network design. This is a joint work with my supervisor, Lap Chi. Uh, so let's start with some background on network design. And the survivable network design is the most well-studied network work design problem. And in this problem, we are given an undirected graph G as input. Each edge of the graph has a cost. Um, we have another input, a connectivity requirement, FUB, for each pair of vertices U and B. So the goal of this problem is to find a minimum cost subgraph so that there are at least FUB edge disjoint paths for each pair of UV. So this problem captures many classical problems as special case, including the standard tree problem we have solved in the first talk. And so far, the most uh, general and powerful techniques in network design are based on linear programming. So, for example, the LP based iterative routing algorithm proposed by Jane in 2001 is still the best known algorithm for the general survival network design. The iterative routing techniques is very general. It has been extended to handle degree constraints and some other structure linear constraints. Um, let's consider some motivations of extending the traditional network design. Uh, consider these two graphs. Both of them are four regular and four edge connected. So the connectivity and the degree constraints cannot distinguish uh, these two graphs. However, the graph on the right hand side uh, has some uh, nicer properties than the cycle graph. For example, uh, there are sparse cars in the cycle graph, but the graph on the right hand side is where it's bending, which means we can travel or transport the resources from part of the graph to other parts much easier. In general, the graph expansion property and the many other properties like the effective resistance and random work related quantities cannot be captured by LP framework. Um, Note that all the properties listed here uh, are related to graph spectrum. And in fact, graph spectrum contains very rich information of the combinatorial structure of a graph. And therefore, it is very natural that a network designer want to have better control over the spectral properties of the graph in the context of network design. And so this is our main problem. Uh, in addition to those traditional constraints, we also consider two types of spectral constraints, the effective resistance constraint and the algebraic connectivity constraint. To solve this problem, we can write a large convex program for this problem, which can be solved in polynomial time. Then after obtaining a optimal fractional solution X for this convex program, our goal is to design a rounding scheme to find a good integral solution. 
uh, okay. So one simple but very important observation in this work is that the rounding of the convex program reduces to the following special rounding problem, where we want to find the integral solution such that the Laplacian matrix of the integral solution is approximately equal to the fractional Laplacian matrix. And the cost of the integral solution is approximately equal to the fractional cost. So know that the spectral requirement here actually captures all the connectivity uh, constraints. So our first main result uh, for network design is a randomized algorithm achieves cost not far away from the optimal, but subject to some additive error term here. And the n is the number of vertices in the graph, and the C max is the largest cost in the input. And then know that when the optimal is large, we can actually achieve a constant approximation, which already captures some interesting cases. So we can handle most of the constraints except the degree constraint with this algorithm. Uh, the result is based on the regular minimization framework for spectral graph, uh, spe uh, graph spectral specification. The algorithm extends uh, some known results to handle linear constraints, uh, the result of Alan, Zhu, Lee, Singh, and Wang. Our second result uh, uh, is an integrated gap result with some additional con uh, con uh, conditions on the fractional solution X, we can show that there exists an integral solution with stronger approximation guarantee, and that we can handle all but the linear packing and the covering constraints. The result depends on the approach of interlacing uh, polynomial, therefore it is non-constructive. Uh, we prove this result with a simple but a nice uh, black box reduction to a recent result by King, Lu, and Song, which is the extension to the MSS result. Uh, okay, I think I will stop here, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Song. Uh, so let's see while we're waiting to see if there, um, if there are questions. Um, so I think if you're, I'll relate to something that was in the, in the longer talk, uh, and by the way, I want to say that somehow, it, 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 I think we're told kind of there was an expectation people will see the talks before. And actually, I also, I think the short talks are kind of like an advertisement. So I think the order, it makes sense to see also the short and then, and then go to the long. But since I saw the long one, um, so you, you talked a little bit about um, kind of extending the, these, these techniques. And um, so what thoughts do you have? Like, where would you go from here, from here on? Uh... Oh, you mean for the future works? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, one of the uh, like uh, uh, apparent uh, uh, open problems, like uh, can we re fully recover Jane's uh, iterative rounding result with special approach? So uh, currently, like uh, our approach cannot fully match Jane's result uh, it, because we need the like a fractional optimal, uh, optimal value should be greater than n times c max so that we can have a constant approximation. Uh, can we use spectral approach to, to recover James' result? I think this is uh, one interesting question. But with the spectral rounding, we reduced to the spectral rounding problem. Uh, in our paper, we have some examples showing that spectral rounding actually, like our result is somehow tight. We can not really like uh, end that. But it's interesting to see whether there are some other spectral approach can match James. Okay, thanks. So in the meantime, we have a couple of questions. Um, uh, do you know whether you violate the constraints by a little, or are there examples where they are violated by a lot? Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, that's a good question. So let me go to this slide. So here, I'm actually cheating a little bit, satisfies all the uh, constraints. So I can satisfy the connectivity constraints, the spectral constraints, but I cannot satisfy the linear constraints, linear packing and covering constraints. Uh, those co constraints were suffered and lost, uh, similar to here, like some additive error terms. So essentially, when the like the CMAX mass of the uh, cost is large, then we are actually lost a lot. Okay, and we have one more question. Uh, can you comment on the running time for spectral rounding parts? Um, is it far from linear time? I mean, how, how polynomial or how, 
what, what is the, yeah, about the running time? Yes, um, the number of iter iterations will be uh, kind of polynomial, uh, some kind of thing like a, 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 like a input set of epsilon. Uh, but for each iteration, uh, a naive in, in, uh, implementation, I think, can be done in like a, n to the omega, the matrix multiplication time, because we need to calculate some like a, a matrix inverse inversion. Uh, but I think that uh, computation time can be improved with some recent techniques, but I didn't like try really hard uh, in this part. Okay, so thanks, so thanks Hong again. And we'll continue to the, to the next talk of this session. So our next talk is lifting sum of squares lower bounds, degree two to degree four, and Jeff Shu will give the talk. Uh, Jeff, you're still mute. Uh, so I should mute myself and then I'll. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And I'm Jeff, and I'm going to tell you about our work on lifting some of squares lower bumps. And this is joint work with Sita Mohanty and Professor Govinja Berkeley. So, in this work, we consider the problem of strength and Kirkpatrick coming from statistical physics. We are given a symmetric matrix M of ID Gaussian entries. So you can also think of M as coming from like the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And then the question we consider is we want to certify upper bounds on X transpose MX when X comes from the Boolean hypercube. So like plus or minus one to the N. And a naive attempt here is to output the largest eigenvalue as an upper bound. And it will be lambda max of the input matrix times N for some normalization. However, from studies in statistical physics, we actually know that the optimal value is concentrated around 0.76 times the largest eigenvalue. So we have a non-trivial gap here. In particular, when M is the Gaussian matrix, we have a gap of 1.52 versus 2 here. And a question we want to answer is whether this gap is inherent to all polynomial time computation. And we believe so. And in this work, we give a partial confirmation to this belief. So since this is a talk on SOS, I'm obligated to tell you something about sum of squares. It's a hierarchy of increasingly powerful algorithms, and we know it's super powerful. It's optimal for all CSPs like constraint satisfaction problems under unique game conjecture, and it captures the best algorithms for many average case problems, including refuting random CSP and plenty click. So let me give you a quick overview of SOS. It takes in some input and it gives us a huge matrix, a matrix of size n to a d by n to a d actually. And for now, let's think of d as being constant, so everything is polynomial size. And this matrix specifies the moments of the pseudo solution. And what we mean by that is that you can ask SOS what it thinks the solution should look like on a most d coordinates. And we also want the matrix to be normalized and to be positive semi-definite namely SOS you've seen that the square of anything is non-negative. And beyond what I just told you, SOS is also a proof system and it can be efficiently solved using semi-definite programming. So there is some past work in the problem we consider. In particular, Montanari's saying show that when M is the Gaussian matrix or the Laplacian of random regular graph, degree two SOS cannot do better than the trivial eigenvalue bound that we just saw. In particular, I want to know that when M is the Laplacian here, uh, the objective value X transpose MX is merely the mass cut of the graph. Also, we have some non rigorous predictions by Bandera, Kuniski, and Wen, who show that when M is the Gaussian matrix, we should expect Hannes, SOS Hannes, at degree N over log N. So here are our results. We say that when M is the Gaussian matrix or the Laplacian of random regular graph, Degree 4 SOS cannot be the trivial eigenvalue bound we just saw. And there is also a concurrent work by Kuniski and Bandera, who independently proved the Gaussian result. And I think I'll skip this for now, but we can get back to this if we have time in the end. So beyond what I just told you, our result is actually more general. We say that for any Boolean optimization problems you have, namely you are searching for an X over the Boolean hypercube, 
if you have a degree two solution that has large objective value, then we can always transform it into a degree four solution of large objective value. Our construction is motivated by a powerful machine learning developed in previous works called pseudo calibration. So here's a peek at our main theorem for the SOS enthusiast. I understand it could be a little bit daunting. It's actually uh, scary to me as well. But let me just demystify a little bit here. This is an explicit formula to transform a degree two solution to a degree four solution, subject to some constraints on the original degree two solution. So we cannot do this for all degree two solution. And it applies to Boolean optimization problems. So that will include uh, Shannon, Kirkpatrick, and Mascon already. And let me end by uh, taking a note on the future work. Since we know SOS is a hierarchy of increasingly powerful algorithms, so it's curious to see what goes on beyond degree four. Actually, there is a recent follow-up work by GJJPR, who showed an amazing end to the delta degree lower bound for the strengthen Kirkpatrick problem. However, the, the lower bound for mass count remains open, and we also don't know what's going on at higher degree SOS. And beyond this, we also want to see like if we can get SOS lower bounds for more average case problems. And if we can hope for a more general lifting theorem that applies beyond our setting, and we, it's also be nice to see if we can get a lifting to higher degree. Yeah, I think I end my talk here. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so thanks, Jeff, for the talk, and we already have some questions waiting here. So the first one is, uh, can you elaborate on what the non-rigorous predictions from ben Gurria, Kunski, when are uh, and why they're non-rigorous? Yes, so this non-rigorous prediction is based on this hypothesis that low degree polynomial captures low degree SOS. So this is a conjecture made by Sam Hopkins and David Stoyer earlier. And here they, um, so it's non-rigorous because we actually don't know whether low degree polynomial is actually equivalent to low degree SOS. And they didn't actually uh, exhibit an SOS low bound yet. But we do believe that if the heuristic goes, or, uh, goes through, we should be able to hope for SOS low bound. But this is a wide open conjecture in this area. Okay, thanks. Uh, so the next one is uh, who are GJ, GJJPR? So what is the reference? So I think people are curious about yeah, that. I, Maybe you can say a few more words about that. Yeah, uh, okay. I think I know of them personally, but this is a group of people at Chicago, at U Chicago, and uh, like, yeah, I, I think it's hard for me to list everyone in order right now, but P is Aaron Polichin. So, and, and so where was this, so, when, so people can search for it? So this was- Oh, sorry, like, I don't see- Where was it published or where was it uh, posted? Maybe afterwards you can put it Kind of uh, um, on the channel of the paper, you can put the details about the people uh, yes, yes. they are because I think people are really, uh, I think they are kind of uh, yeah, curious yeah, about it. Really yes, but yeah, the work is not public yet. For now. It's not public. Oh, okay. so they didn't post it yeah. yet. Okay, okay. So I guess you have to, to wait. But whatever information you have, maybe it'll be nice if you put it uh, on the channel so that people can, can, can see. Okay, so that's uh, about names. Uh, okay, and another question is, can you explain what pseudo calibration is? Yeah, pseudo calibration, I, mean, I think we have a nice introduction in our 20 minute talk like on the YouTube. But for now, so pseudo calibration is basically a heuristic to construct SOS low bounds. Because SOS low bounds suffice to, it always comes down to constructing the moment matrix that I just described earlier, like this moment matrix. So pseudo calibration gives us a way to fill in the entries there. Um, so let me see, there, I think there are more about the names. Uh, okay, so, so just uh, uh, clarifying here. So Siddhant, who's a co-author, says that the citation is with permission. So, oh, and we have, and we have here the names. Uh, Madhur says it's Ghost, Geronimo, Jones, Kotechin, and Roger. So it appears here, um, uh, here on the, um, first, okay, correction, first name is Gosh, okay. So it looks like we have, we have that, uh, we have that settled. Um, so I'll just uh, see if we have any more, any more questions here. Um, so, okay, so if we don't have any more, any more uh, questions, uh, then I'll thank Jeff again. 
and we'll continue to setting up our, our next talk, which is the fourth talk of this session, fourth and last. Okay. Okay, so our fourth and last talk of this session is fast sampling and counting KSAT solutions in the local lemma regime. And it will be given by Wei Ming Feng. Wei Ming, please. Thank you for introduction. Mm, today I'm going to talk about fast sampling and counting KSAT solutions in the local lemma regime. This is a joint work with Heng Guo, Yi Tongying, and Chi Hao Zhang. And Yi Chongying is my advisor. Okay. So our work centers on CNF formula, which is a conjunction of one or more classes. In particular, we consider a special class called KD CNF formulas. Each class contains K variables, and each variable belongs to at most D classes. The example below is a 3 2 CNF formula. A set solution is an assignment of variables such that all the clauses are satisfied. By Lova's local lemma, the solution exists if k is roughly greater than log d. We focus on the sampling and counting problems. The input is a thing as formula phi. When sampling, the algorithm needs to draw an almost uniform random solution. Specifically, let mu denote the uniform distribution of all k set solutions. The total variation distance between the output distribution and the mu should be bounded by epsilon. The counting problem requires to estimate the number of solutions z. The algorithm should output an epsilon approximation to z. Two problems are closely related. If we can perform almost a uniform sampling, then by some reduction, so we can do approximate counting. So we will focus mainly on the sampling problem. From previous works, we have sampling algorithms for specific classes of CNF formulas. An important improvement was made by Moitra. The his algorithm is quite different from the traditional sampling techniques and has a running time n to the poly dk. So it still requires d and k to be constant. In addition, by the Kova et al. proved a lower bound result. If k is less than 2 log d, the sampling problem is empty hard. So in this work, we give a new sampling algorithm based on Markov chain. If k is roughly greater than 20 log d, our algorithm is very fast. The running time is very close to linear. More formally, for any small parameters zeta, if k is greater than 20 log d plus 20 log k, plus three log one over zeta, our algorithm has a running time of tilde d squared k cubed n to the one plus zeta. If the parameter zeta becomes smaller, the condition becomes less confined and our algorithm becomes faster. Now let's have a look at the algorithm. The most classical approach for sampling is global dynamics. It starts from an arbitrary solution in each step we pick a variable uniformly at random and resample its value conditioning on other variables. So the global dynamics is actually a random work over solution space, but unfortunately for CNF problems, the solution space is disconnected. So the Markov chain cannot converge to the uniform distribution. This problem is called the connectivity barrier. The main contribution of this paper is a new technique to bypass this connectivity barrier. We project from a high dimension to a lower one to improve the connectivity. For example, in this picture, the three red objects are disconnected, but after projection, their shadows become connected. So our algorithm first constructs a good subset of variables M then we use global dynamics on projected distribution mu m to sample an assignment of m. Here mu m is the marginal distribution on m projected from the uniform distribution. Finally, given the assignment of m, we sample the assignment of other variables from the conditional distribution. For this purpose, we need to prove the following three points. First, the set m should be constructed efficiently and we use more than Tardish algorithm to do this. 
Second, the global dynamics on the project distribution should be rapidly mixing, and we use the path coupling to, do, to prove this. The third, the global dynamics and the step two should be implemented efficiently, and we use the rejection sampling to achieve this task. So these are the key points of our algorithm. Now, in conclusion, in this work, we give a near-linear time sampling algorithm for CNF solutions, and we also give a near-quadratic time counting algorithm by reduction. Technical-wise, we use projection to bypass the connectivity barrier of MCMC method. There are some interesting open problems. For example, to push the threshold down to k greater than 2 log d. If so, we can obtain the optimal regime for sampling and counting set solutions. Second, to generalize our technique to more general distributions, such as sample the uniform sample from the uniform distribution of hypergraph QKLE. So that's all. Thank you for listening. So thanks, Owen. Um, and while I was waiting to see if there are more questions, I actually have uh, have um, a couple. So uh, first, okay. what are when you say a good a good set M? I don't know how yeah. can you say a few words. What does it mean that it's good? The, the, okay. The, Okay, you ask how to construct the good set M. Not so, how to construct, but what, what are the properties? What do you need of M so that- Okay, okay. Okay, I got your question. So at first, the set M should be constructed efficiently. The second, the global dynamics defined on the projected distribution mu M should be rapidly mixing. So this is a very important property for our algorithm. And the third point is that this global dynamics can be implemented efficiently. And in the last step, you know, after the second step, we get an assignment on M, but we still need to sample the assignment of other variables. So, so we should guarantee and this, this step can be achieved efficiently. So to construct, uh, okay, this is my answer. Okay, so in the meantime, I have a couple more questions, but I'll, I'll, now I'll, I'll give it to the audience first. Um, uh, what are some potential applications of sampling and counting KSAT? Oh, uh, this is a good question, but an um, application I see, um, you may, maybe you can, uh, using this technique to do the, to solve some inference problem in practice, I think, because sampling and counting are closely related to the inference. And the next question by Will. Uh, do you know if your algorithm might work, might work up to D? Okay, let's see. It, the, actually, D that goes up to like a constant times two to the K over two, or would you need yeah. a different algorithm? So when D becomes very large, that's, uh, that's the question. Okay, that's a very good question. Um, um, I don't know whether our algorithm can achieve this, this bound, but Currently, our analysis doesn't work. Uh, this is because I think that because of two points. The first is that we need to construct this set M. This will give a very strong requirement of D and K. The second is that we use the path coupling to analysis the micro chain. I think it's not, I think we cannot obtain the optimum mixing time if we normally use the path coupling. And another question, uh, is this projection GD connected to down up random walk in high dimensions? Uh, yes, um, I think any global dynamics can be, uh, is a special case of the uh, random walk on high dimension. But in this, in this work, we do not consider the high dimensional random walk Maybe you can use the high dimensional random work technique to analysis our algorithm. Um, yeah, uh, maybe you can, but I didn't do it. It's very uh, promising. It, it's, it's very promising, I think. Okay, thanks. Well, and so the question is, so where, where does the 20, the factor 20 that you require, where does it come from? Where does it? Uh, uh, oh, okay. So, you know, we, we need to guarantee the following three points. Each point will 
uh, re give a, a requirement between K and D. And uh, finally, we solve an optimization problem of all constraints and we get the 20. Great. Okay, so... Um, so it's, it's a very okay. artificial, I think. Yeah, no, I, I assume I just want to say, uh, where is it? Yeah, where does it, uh, where does it come from? Um, okay, so let's see, we don't have any, any more questions uh, right now. So uh, I'll thank Wei Ming and actually all the speakers uh, of this session. And now what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll stop the recording and then I'll wait a few minutes to see if there is... Um,